Labor Talk Show here in Southern Maine on Public Access Television. This evening we are doing a Labor Day special show, and I'm here in the studios of WMPG in Portland, Maine, uh, on the set of Big Talk. And with me are some big talkers, Professor Mike Hillard, Hi, uh, University of Southern Maine, and a regular on our show. Uh, to my left is uh, Professor Artis Cameron, uh, Associate Professor of uh, American Everything and here. New England Studies. There we go. American and New England Studies here at the university. And Wendy Hazard, editor of The Dissident, a uh, new progressive uh, magazine here in, in uh, Maine that we'll be talking about. Uh, I'm speaking like the Federal Express guy because we're about to go on the air. We're doing the radio show, which will be broadcast very shortly. And uh, our show tonight is going to be a video version of a radio call-in show called Big Talk. So uh, tune in on 90.9 and... Uh, off we go. Are we Please. are we ready? Uh, we're ready any moment. We're waiting for our engineer to okay. give us the signal. This so, is uh, this is a behind the scenes glimpse as yes. how these things work. Community radio, like community TV, is not as always polished, but uh, it's got art. So uh, and politics. There you go. Two things you may not get from the networks, <laughs> the corporate organizations. Uh, well, you get politics. <laughs> <laughs> not the right kind. Yep. I'll, okay. I'll start the show. So, uh, what am I? I uh, what is Unite? No, no. You, what is your role in Unite? I'm the regional director for New England, or for the Maine area, Northern New England. I'm sort of whatever comes along. I'm in charge. <laughs> I'm in charge of. Um, anyway, uh, viewers, glad you could join us and uh, stay tuned. This is going to be a first for Kavanaugh's Car. We're multimedia tonight. So here we go. We'll be starting up any second now. Teresa. Michael. Yeah. Teresa does have a piece. Good. You right, know right. That. Yeah, I do. And listeners, uh, welcome to Big Talk on WMPG. Uh, this is one of your hosts, Michael Hillard. I'm here with my co-host. Wendy Hazard. Wendy, welcome. Uh, tonight, uh, we're doing a Labor Day show in honor of Labor Day coming up uh, this weekend on Monday. And uh, later on in the show, we'll be exploring issues that have to do with labor and working people with uh, two uh, uh, excellent guests for this type of subject. Uh, we're going to have a uh, professor of uh, American New England Studies uh, and a labor historian, uh, uh, well-known uh, for her work on women, uh, artist Cameron, and we'll also have Michael Cavanaugh, uh, who is a regional director for a union called Unite, and I will spell out what Unite is uh, in a couple minutes here. Um, as we normally do when we start our show these days, we do a quick schmooze about the news um, this past week. There are many things to talk about, but we're going to keep it short because we have two very good guests tonight. We want to get to them quickly. Uh, we'll have a uh, feature in a couple minutes after the schmooze, and then we'll get to our guests in a short while. We'll remind our hosts that, um, our guests rather, not our hosts, <laughs> uh, our listeners, uh, remind our listeners that this is community radio, radio if you can't tell. And uh, uh, it's also a call-in show, and we welcome your calls and comments. Uh, the number here is 780-4909. Uh, so, Wendy, I wanted to talk for just a moment about this uh, uh, this month's issue of The Dissident, which you know something about, Well, right? I'm, I'm thrilled and delighted to, to uh, talk about The Dissident. Uh, this is the, the third issue the third of issue? The Dissident. Yeah, um, what is The Dissident? Is, well, it is, a, it is a journal of political and cultural analysis. It's a main journal. Mm -hmm. And really, we brought together, it's a consortium of folks. It's, um, it's a group of academics, um, teachers, um, and also activists who work in various different uh, fields um, to bring about social change, who are concerned also with peace and justice. And uh, so all of these people have come together and mm -hmm. created a journal, um, hopefully that will meet um, some important needs that we felt uh, that, that Maine, me ha Maine has, um, really to provide an alternative progressive voice in the media uh, for, for Maine people. Well, I have to say that I was very excited when I got uh, this week's issue. Um, and uh, I think it really does fill a vacuum. Um, you know, the Maine Times is pretty good. I mean, there, there are some progressive things said and done in the media, uh, present Indeed. company included. Uh, but <laughs> that being said, in terms of print, there's really not much out there that has a clear progressive political perspective. And uh, this month's issue really caught my eye. Uh, there's an, it's on the subject of uh, crime, 
uh, and you cover a great many issues. There's an excellent uh, long piece in there about uh, the whole issue of the expanding prison system that we've incarcerated now three times as many people as 10 or 15 years ago. It's up to a million and a half in prisons and if you include people in jail and on parole we're up to like six or seven million. Um, very sophisticated, very kind of uh, heart-wrenching uh, uh, depiction and analysis of some things going on. So it's an excellent uh, first rate would wouldn't surprise me to see this in a national journal at all. Um, well, so that piece was written, if I could just say, yeah. it was written by uh, Jim Bouchel, who represents um, prisoners, um, and several of his clients uh, are in the maximum security penitentiary in Warren, uh, which is a, a major uh, new facility, which is um, extremely um, tough and draconian um, in its in its approach to to uh, incarceration. So. Yeah, it's kind of what you expect. I mean, the description in the article sounds like what you would expect in a third world country, you know, a banana republic where torture mm -hmm. and dictatorship are the order of the day. Uh, and it's right here in Maine. Yeah, so it's um, important for us to know about. Yes, um, and uh, there was an excellent and uh, quite pertinent piece about uh, uh, sort of the crime against labor uh, that corporations are uh, perpetuating uh, by none other than Mike Kavanaugh. Very nice piece, Mike. Hey, thanks a lot. Huh? Um, no, it really <laughs> struck me because uh, uh, I know that you, uh, and we'll be getting into this in the show, uh, are part of uh, what is a new union organization, and unions in the labor movement are trying to respond to the very difficult conditions mm -hmm. facing labor in the country. Um, and what I really uh, was m most interested to learn about and want to ask you about more is that it talks about uh, uh, some of the really... Uh, questionable practices by uh, the retailers that you see down in Maine, Mall, The Gap, and Banana Republic, mm -hmm. and Fruit of Loom, and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, implications for working people here in Maine, and some discussion there about a campaign that uh, uh, that I believe your organization is uh, trying to run. To right. We'll, we'll have a chance to talk a little bit later here about uh, the Gap campaign, but I suspect our listeners are going to uh, hear more about it and see more about it, and hopefully we'll have some participate in it in the next week or two. Yeah. Great, great. So we'll come back to that. Um, so I just want to let people know that The Dissident is a great thing. Uh, it's got a lot of good stuff in it, uh, some very good people uh, writing in it these days. And uh, uh, Wendy, how would somebody subscribe to The Dissident? Well, you, uh, you write to The Dissident. Uh, we can, you can certainly pick up copies of The Dissident in Portland. Um, you can pick them up at the University Bookstore right mm -hmm. here. You can pick them up at Raffles and Books, etc. Mm -hmm. And um, you, there's a subscription form on the back, and we sure do welcome them. So, you know... Um, and a very them. modest rate. <laughs> very Even modest rate. Even low-income folks, I think, could afford this. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, um, with that, we should probably go to our feature and our main subject tonight. So, in a moment here, just want to remind our listeners that tonight we're going to be talking about labor issues, uh, exploring labor uh, concerns uh, with some labor experts. Um, and we'll be coming back in a couple minutes after this feature. You're listening to Big Talk WNPG. Liberty was founded to honor the struggles for decent wages and safe working conditions. Today, working people are under a whole new set of pressures. Living standards have declined for many, and people are working longer hours to make ends meet. With Labor Day four days away, I wondered how people were feeling in this current climate where unions are being attacked and some members of Congress are talking about eliminating the minimum wage. Here's what some people had to say about Labor Day. It's a celebration of all the hard work we do in this nation, the United States of America. Probably just another holiday for me. Nothing I, special. Well, I don't really associate Labor Day with labor. I associate it with all the tourists going home. <laughs> That's the reason why they have the day is because of the uh, workers who get the day off. I don't think the stores should be open on Labor Day. Work that day. <laughs> no kidding, me too. We don't even get holiday pay for it. Oh, I think the working conditions are better, you know, from 20 years ago. Have to work harder and harder. Make less money. The more that it's like five dollar hour jobs, like retail jobs, and that there's no substantial jobs. Even if you go to college, and that it doesn't guarantee anything. Okay. I mean, I have so many friends that went to college and they're working in, uh, you know, Sears or whatever, but I mean, you know, college degree you should get something from it. Overall, things are, are fairer and, um, and people are, are being treated uh, more equally and um, 
conditions are uh, much more improved. Um, the company's not loyal to their employees now, and the employees don't have to be loyal to the company. Minimum wage is too low. Can't support a family on 4.35 an hour. I think most people don't probably know that, but um, I guess if you think of the sort of true me meaning and support of workers, then I think that would be great in labor law and support of workers, yeah. But I think most of us think of it as sort of a day for a barbecue and the day before school. This Labor Day, we celebrate and honor the struggles of workers while we grapple with a whole new set of economic and political struggles. For Big Talk, this is Teresa Parisi. Back to the studio, this is your host, Michael Hillard on Big Talk, here with my co-host. Wendy Hazard. Hi, Wendy. Michael. Hi, <laughs> Wendy. Uh, and uh, we're here tonight uh, observing Labor Day um, with some people who are intimately involved uh, uh, with matters that have to do with working people. Uh, so let's introduce our guests uh, formally now. Um, first of all, we have Artis Cameron, uh, who's a Big Talk regular this summer. Uh, it's her <laughs> second uh, appearance, and uh, she is a professor of American New England Studies, associate professor here at the University of Southern Maine, author of a recent book, excellent uh, analysis of working women in Lawrence uh, historically and some of the struggles that they're famous for, called Radicals of the Worst Sort, uh, laboring Women in Lawrence, and uh, that is University of Illinois Press, 1994, I believe. And uh, <laughs> another book coming out uh, soon called Modern Times about life, labor, and leisure in America from 1890 to 1930. Uh, artists, welcome. Thanks. And thanks for coming back to Big Talk. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm always here about conditions of work. I think the last time was about sex work. And, uh, Looking That's forward right. to another uh, interesting discussion about workers. A little, bit, right. uh, little bit broader discussion <laughs> tonight, but the issues uh, obviously are, many of them are similar. And also with us tonight, very pleased to have with us in the studio, Michael Cavanaugh. Michael, welcome. Uh, thank you, Mike. Glad to be back. Glad to be here for my first time. Yeah. And uh, that's right, finally, after having been on your show right. a number of times. Right. And, uh, I think uh, we might tell, can we tell our listeners actually that you're currently on our show and that we are in fact, that's right. right now, uh, we are, we're, this is a multimedia broadcast. We're being, we're filming this uh, radio show for our public access television show, uh, Labor Public Access Television. Well, how could they see that? Well, they could see that by tuning in, depending on what community they live in. Uh, in Biddeford, if you live in Biddeford, you'd be watching this tomorrow night at uh, 7.30 on Channel 22. Channel 22, of course, in Biddeford. And here in Portland, we're usually on uh, Tuesday nights, I think, at 7.30 on Channel 2. But uh, public access television is out there, and uh, most communities have it, and uh, viewers should call their uh, public access station to find out when we're on. So... Uh, so for all of those uh, Big Talk listeners who are curious as to what the hosts look like, this is your big chance. <laughs> um, and I wanted to say that... The uh, real sex workers. <laughs> <laughs> well, that. that was not broadcast on our show. I just want to assure our viewers in Biddeford that we know nothing of what this was all about. Uh, <laughs> before we move on, I did want to say that uh, Michael Kavanaugh has been working the labor movement for some time. And most recently, uh, his former union, the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers, joined with the historic union, the International Labor Ladies' Garment Workers' Union, the ILGWU, to form a new, larger entity called UNITE. That's correct, yes. And that stands for, Michael? This is the Union of Needle Trades, Industrial, and Textile Employees, or UNITE, and uh, I think the name says it all. It doesn't really matter what industry, it's about workers uniting. And that's right. who we are. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a theme that we'll explore later tonight, and you are the uh, director for Northern New England. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so... Uh, why don't we turn to a discussion of things labor? And I wanted to start off tonight with some things that I know have been on your mind, and I think we're being discussed in the studio before we went on air here. Um, and that is, uh, uh, you know, listening to what we heard in the future, um, it's not too far of a stretch to say that, you know, in the last 20 years, it's almost as if there's been a silent class war being waged on working people. We have, uh, uh, you know, declining living standards, probably for the bottom 80 percent um, wages. Uh, you know, peaked in 1973 and now fallen down, I think, to where they were in 1959 for the average worker. Um, we've had the rise of what's become the disposable worker. Corporations make no more commitments. Uh, employers make no more commitments to their workers anymore. They don't offer benefits. They don't offer permanent status. And, uh, you know, it's almost to the point where a lot of workers are working day labor, like what we used to see 100 years ago in the throes of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, an attack on workers' rights that has been sustained for 20 years and has made the idea that we have worker rights and labor law in this country kind of a sham. And last but not least, in recent years, especially with the uh, 
Republican victory, quote unquote, last fall, and that 20 out of 39 percent of American voters mm. voted in uh, uh, Gingrich and company. Um, the scapegoating of women and non-whites, um, and definitely workers and in the area of affirmative action, one of the, the gains of the labor movement. Um, so we see this uh, kind of class war going on. Is, is that too strong a language to use, Michael? I, I think it's uh, a quite appropriate language, actually. The, you know, we are always accused of fomenting class divisions and mm -hmm. class hatred mm -hmm. and so on. And, and we're supposed to accept the uh, myth that somehow there is no class society in the United States, that we're all, you know, we're all middle class or we're all, you know, the American class or something. Uh, but in fact, I mean, most working people have, as you say, found their, their incomes and their standards of living, not just their incomes, but their overall standards of living, services, uh, educational services and so on, declining. And it has not been by accident and it hasn't been without struggle. Mm -hmm. And it has been a... Uh, you know, it's been a class war that uh, one class uh, doesn't even recognize itself as a class, and it's and it's losing. Um, and uh, just to follow up on that, um, you and your own work, I know in the industries, uh, the, the companies, the women workers in particular mm -hmm. that you uh, uh, tend to have represented, uh, have really taken it hardest uh, here in Maine. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of things do you see? How do you see that played out in uh, the people you work with and for? Well, the kind of industries that we represent in the in the clothing and textile uh, industry, the kind of workforce, are uh, predominantly women. That's been true, you know, for many many years. Um, and as probably, you know, people know of the fact that you know workers have lost their jobs, plants have closed as they've moved to the south, and then from the south they've moved offshore to uh, whether it was Singapore, Taiwan, China, Central America, or anywhere in the world. Uh, I think, interestingly, just in the last uh, few weeks, really, some of the exploitation of workers in this industry has really come, uh, gotten a lot more uh, uh, publicity around that whole, uh, uh, you know, slave labor camp that was mm -hmm. uncovered in Los Angeles. The Thai workers. The Thai workers, mm -hmm. the 70-some Thai workers who were literally slaves uh, held to uh, produce clothing for, you know, major uh, retailers in the United States. and. I think that you know, there was so much public attention focused on that because people thought it was somehow so uh, extraordinary and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, could, how could this be happening in America in the 1990s? And I think as you peel it back a little bit and look underneath, you find uh, that conditions aren't all that far off those conditions in, in uh, factories uh, really around the world in employing you know, millions of people, and there are over a million people employed in the apparel industry in the United States, primarily women, primarily, you know, immigrant or, or you know, women of color in urban areas, um, and at very, very low wages. And that's, that's been true. And I don't know, artists probably has a perspective no, I, on I, that I, as yeah, well. Artist, artist camera, why don't you wait? Yeah. Well, I remember reading that story, and um, it was like out of the, the early 20th mm -hmm. century. I mean, you could see the shirtwaist uh, workers right. who uh, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in 1911 mm -hmm. where about 142 women were trapped inside of a sweatshop um, on the 10th floor of a building in mid-Manhattan, mm -hmm. uh, garment workers, all of them, and because they were shut, literally locked in, they had no way to get out of that, that fire, and they literally jumped to their death. Mm -hmm. And that image was a very stark one in the early 20th century for the conditions of these workers, most of whom, as you pointed out, were women and, and immigrants or children of immigrants. Mm -hmm. And uh, reading that paper, those images were very much uh, like that, the same symbolic um, you know, uh, sort of catastrophe that, that finally shows on the surface of the public imagination mm -hmm. that was buried there. Mm -hmm. um, and I often wondered what the difference is in some ways between the early 20th century in terms of the alliances that were made between the garment workers and uh, middle class progressives and the lack of that kind of alliance, mm -hmm. really, today, mm -hmm. uh, as we look around at the garment industry. I think I remember um, working it out some, at some point, the, uh, the Nation had an article last year about the garment industry and the Gap uh, in particular, and they pointed out that for every $100 that's taken in for a, a dress, let's say a dress that's made mm -hmm. and sold for $100, the worker actually gets 50 cents mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and that's not different. That's not, that's not at all different from, as you point out, of what it was exactly in 1910. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they they, they the used to call that exploitation. You're right, they used to. Yeah, it's, it's now the New World Economic Order or something else. But right, it's, it's this New World Order. the same story. Yeah. I want to just, yeah. um, we, we are gathered here, um, you know, looking, looking towards the celebrating of the Labor Day weekend, and uh, people are packing their picnic, you know, boxes and that kind of thing. Um, but um, Labor Day was, was established as a day to celebrate the struggles of working people and the struggles of organized labor, and also a way of, as I, as I understand it, of, um, of celebrating that and, and showing other people in America, other people who were not uh, struggling for those particular rights, mm-hmm. that, that this is what was going on and that we could join together in a common kind of celebratory spirit around Labor Day. What's happened to Labor Day? Um, and I, I guess I throw that out to both mm-hmm. of you. Um, first of all, are we going to see a Labor Day celebration in Portland? Well, actually, there there is going to be a, a Labor Day uh, activity here. Um, we're, we're not doing a Labor Day parade. I mean, the, the Labor Day parades are happening in some of the large city. New York has a you know traditional very large Labor Day parade, and other uh, cities do as well. Uh, Maine, we have not really done a big Labor Day a parade really since the uh, the J strike back in eighty seven eighty eight I think was the last time we had a very large uh, parade rally demonstration in Waterville around the whole J strike and so on. Uh, for the last few years, different things have been done to try to commemorate the day, and and the reality is that people do uh, you know look at it as a holiday and. You know, work, it's a day off of work for working people, and they're interested in spending time with their families as well. Uh, so, to make a long story short, what we're doing this year is uh, we, as uh, the AFL-CIO and the Portland Labor Council, are sponsoring the last game of the season at Hadlock Field for the Portland Sea Dogs. And uh, we're, we bought up uh, 2,000 tickets for union members and their families to come to, and celebrate together what is you know a great American tradition, a great labor tradition, and uh, you know a, a really fun day together at uh, at Hadlock Field, and we are doing this uh, and and try to take advantage of that opportunity to to remind people what the day is all about. We have uh, uh, a flyer here which will hold up for those of you who are viewing this uh, show. <laughs> for those of you who aren't, I'm going to if I if I might just read. We put a couple paragraphs together here, and we're going to hand this out as a program to everybody who comes through the gates. At the baseball game, we have all the names and you know numbers of the ball players, so you can mm-hmm. follow along. And we also have our union yes uh, slogan on the on the flyer to remind people that this is Labor Day. And let me just, if I might, say it'll say the men and women of the Maine AFL-CIO welcome you to Labor Day with the Sea Dogs. Labor Day has been a state holiday in Maine since 1891, when organized labor fought for and won recognition for the contributions to society from the laboring class. The first president of the American Federation of Labor, Samuel Gompers, came to Maine and joined thousands of Maine workers at Sebago Lake in, on Labor Day of 1891, and he declared at that time wealth is a public trust and the right to have something to say about wages and hours of labor pertain to the workers from who the, whom the wealth comes. The struggle to win recognition for the dignity of labor and the rights of workers to form unions was never easy. Workers in Maine who tried to form unions in the 1880s faced a Maine conspiracy law which made strikes conspiracies punishable by two years in jail. Blacklists of labor organizers and legal discrimination against workers who tried to organize were common obstacles in Maine and throughout the United States. Then as now, workers had to have courage and commitment to stand up for their rights. Many sacrifices were made over the years to win recognition for the rights of workers to freely join together and form unions to improve wages, hours, and conditions of work. Labor Day was established as a national day of honor and recognition for the men and women who do the work in this society. In 1995, working people again need courage and commitment to stand up for their right to the American dream. Shipbuilders, mill workers, clerical workers, health care workers, and part-time, no-benefit temporary workers all face the same struggle, to have their jobs and their lives recognized and rewarded as important in this society. The unions of the Maine AFL-CIO are proud to stand up for Maine's working families. We are here today to honor and recognize the contributions and the dignity of Maine labor. Maine labor is proud to sponsor the 1995 Labor Day game with the Portland Sea Dogs. 
Well so said, Mike. That's, How yeah. do you get tickets for that? Well, tickets actually were sold out. Uh, yep. to, however, I have three tickets in my pocket. And here, you know, is... <laughs> I'm expecting to see the three of you at the game. I'll oh. provide you tickets afterwards. I'm going to the uh, Bread and Roses Festival. Oh, well, in, in Lawrence. Lawrence. That's right. That's a great... Uh, another way of celebrating Labor Day. Yeah. But um, what, goes on at, what goes on in Lawrence? Well, it's interesting. I, um, I, I just wanted to... Uh, well, what goes on in Lawrence, basically, is uh, picked up in 1979, 1980. And it's a combination Labor Day ethnic festival but it's um, really organized around a commemoration and celebration of the strike of 1912. And it's a way of drawing attention not only to the immigrant populations of Lawrence, but also the ways in which that population created uh, and was really the backbone of the garment industry and the ways in which the strike of 1912 really has become in recent years a symbol for bread and for roses too, that is for what we could call today the quality of life issues. Uh, we want better wages, but better conditions, a better life, uh, a better environment, uh, a better world for our children. And so that symbol is a part of the Labor Day celebrations that go on, uh, not only in Lawrence, by the way, but also in New York City, it, it uses that particular symbol. But if I, if I could, I just wanted to uh, get back to something Wendy was saying in terms of the, uh, the history of Labor Day and some of the very fine line, I think, that the American Labor Union has had to, to walk uh, in the past uh, 100 years or so. Uh, as you pointed out, uh, Mike, putting uh, you know, a baseball game, for example, with the Labor Day, the connotation that we are American, that our struggle is American, uh, that's necessary because in the early 20th century, but again in the 1950s, again in the 1980s, uh, always we're told that these are foreign ideas, that these are somehow subversive ideas, that these are socialist ideas, that these are communist ideas that in some way we're un-American if we believe in these kinds of things. And when Labor Day was founded in 1882 in New York City by the central labor unions, one of the things they had to do was to really script themselves uh, in a way that, that upheld notions of America and uh, always keeping that in mind. But in 19, I'm sorry, in 1890, uh, there was another uh, day that was to commemorate around the world labor movements, and that, of course, is May Day. Mm -hmm. uh, and May Day, ironically, was founded uh, in Paris in, in 1890, and it was suggested to coincide with a strike that the AFL was sponsoring in America for the eight-hour day. Mm -hmm. But because it was in Paris and it was promoted by the Socialist Party, uh, Americans felt very nervous about that. The AFL, AFL, I should say, felt very nervous about that, as did national leadership. And so there was a distancing between the May Day event and the event that we now call Labor Day on September the 5th or the first Monday in September. And so you had this real divide so that uh, most of your radicals, your socialists, your communists, your leftists, and your immigrants would march traditionally on May Day. Uh, while the, the, the more craft-oriented, skilled workers, male workers would, wor we would, would organize and march on uh, the first uh, Monday of the month, which is Labor Day. So you had a split that has gone back and forth in America throughout the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a tragic you know, split. And I think um, we need to do a lot, I think, to bring back the left, the American labor movement, uh, it's critical at this point, and I think if you're looking for the past 20 years, some of the discussion I'd like to talk about later about this decline in American labor, uh, decline in, in um, the environment, decline in um, working conditions, but also an increase in the number of hours people are working, uh, part of that is a result of the purging of the left in the 1950s and the purges that went on really in the 1980s too. I, and I really think that's uh, something we need to, to address. As a Could I, can I follow you up on that? Because you mentioned earlier, Artis, um, the, as a result of the, of the terrible tragedy in that, uh, the 1911 Triangle fire, right. um, that, that that galvanized people's attention and mm -hmm. was such a tragic event that, as you were suggesting, that it reached out, the message of that um, reached out to middle class women reformers and became something that um, the labor movement could then reach out into that sort of middle class 
mm -hmm. uh, uh, group. Mm -hmm. And again, you see that uh, distinction between uh, do we want to stress the sort of radical international aspects of the labor movement, or are we trying to build a base in this country, which as you, Mike, were saying, we have this mythology about the classlessness of this country. Mm -hmm. And how does that work? I mean, uh, is, it, is it really possible to, to bring those two strands together in the labor movement? I have an like opinion about. Yeah, my, my opinion is that it, that it's that it's absolutely necessary to do. I think it's possible around issues that you know people can identify with as sort of social justice questions. I mean, when when labor can get marginalized as a special interest that it's defending its own, so you know, allegedly privileged position. I mean, the, you know, it's sort of a joke if you're actually a worker right. uh, to think that your position right. to be able to work, you know, long hours for low pay is privileged, but. Nonetheless, uh, that is the way it's often characterized. But when we, we are able to focus around uh, issues that uh, I think people can sort of see the social justice connection of, and, and maybe I might at this point sort of talk about, you made reference to this gap thing earlier. I think this, this fits very well right here. Uh, our union representing workers in the uh, clothing and textile industries, of course, has to be international in our outlook because our, the jobs are now international. I mean, when they talk about it's a global economy, it's for real in our industry. Our, our plants have been exported, uh, you know, NAFTA, GATT, at all our realities. And as a consequence, we have our jobs and our members' livelihoods are directly threatened and undercut by corporations who are able to exploit workers in the third world at very low wages. Uh, right now, today, uh, we have uh, well, last month I had the opportunity to meet some workers from El Salvador and Honduras who are up touring the United States, uh, sponsored by our union, uh, because they were fired for trying to organize a union in their own plant. There's one plant in particular in, uh, in El Salvador. Uh, it's a plant that makes clothing for companies including The Gap, which is sort of how The Gap gets into the story. It's not owned by The Gap. It's a uh, so-called maquiladora plant that's... Uh, uh, owned actually in this case by a group from Taiwan, but nonetheless they produce work uh, for companies like The Gap. And the women uh, who work there are young women aged you know, 14, 15, 16 years old uh, who are working 14-hour days. They're, they average 56 cents an hour, um, and you know, they are cruelly exploited. Um, they came to the United States, they came to our union's convention and spoke about their conditions and they connected with the women who were at the convention who work, you know, for six and seven dollars an hour, uh, you know, who struggle to make, you know, clothing for those same giant retailers. And one obviously is being played off against the other, underbidding, one underbidding the other. Well, we are trying to publicize the plight of the workers of El Salvador, in this case, who are making clothing for the Gap. Uh, because it's a you know it's a tragedy that's happening to them, but it's also undercutting all of our standards here. These the standards of work and working conditions and wages for workers in this country. Um, uh, fortunately, there have been some columnists, uh, Bob Herbert of the New York Times, uh, prominent among them, who's picked up on this story and has publicized it, uh, written some uh, articles uh, which uh, called "Sweatshop Beneficiaries: How to Get Rich on 56 Cents an Hour." Uh, that's referring to uh, how the the gap. the gap gets rich by paying 56 cents an hour for a production of its clothing. How the Gap is selling a shirt for $20 that they're paying uh, the laboring uh, people 16 cents to produce. And so where's the rest of the money gone? Right. Uh, let me uh, interject for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, as we always do in the middle of the show, uh, we take a very short break. And uh, so I want to remind our listeners that uh, you're listening to Big Talk on WMPG, Gorham, Portland, uh, and we'll be back in a moment or two. Uh, please stay with us. With my co-host, Wendy Hazard. Wendy, welcome back. And uh, we're also here with our guest, Artis Cameron, Associate Professor of American Studies here at the University of Southern Maine and Labor Historian, and Michael Cavanaugh, who is the Northern New England Regional Director for UNITE. Um, which is the Union of Needle, Needle Trades, Trades, Industrial and Textile Employees. Thank you. Uh, Unite. Um, and uh, we're here tonight exploring uh, issues that have to do with Labor Day and working people. And I'll remind our listeners that this is a call-in talk, call-in show. And uh, we have a number here, 780-4909. You can call in with a question or a comment. And uh, we're going to uh, 
You were talking about uh, the exploitation of women uh, here in the United States and in Central America by American companies uh, uh, like the Gap, and there's a campaign that we're going to come back and talk about at the right. end of the show. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to turn now to artists, and artists, you know, you've done this wonderful research about uh, uh, the complex struggles and the complex uh, lives of working women in Lawrence, and uh, uh, there's so many lessons of that history that are relevant to these kind of issues today. We'd love to hear uh, hear, hear a bit on, on your, your work. Well, um, thanks for the opportunity um, to do that. Maybe I could make a link with something that uh, Michael was talking about in terms of the uh, commodification uh, of uh, labor. We were talking about the gap and, and um, the, uh, the ways in which that might be connected to the labor movement itself you know, in, the, in the 20th century. One of the things that Wendy uh, brought up was the whole history of Labor Day itself. And one of the questions you had, I think, was about, you know, the shift between Labor Day being about workers and about the struggle for workers. And, and Michael, the, these parades that you mentioned in the early part of the 20th century, they were huge parades, uh, gigantic events. And today, as some of your listeners were pointing out in that little uh, blurb you mm -hmm. had there in the report, uh, mentioned that today it's really much more about leisure activities. Mm -hmm. It's about tourists going home. It's about recreation. And I think all of these things are kind of combined because uh, there's a recent book by Juliet Shore called The Overworked American. And one of the things she notices and talks about is the way in which Americans today are working harder, uh, much harder, many more hours. In fact, by the year 2000, we'll probably be working uh, the same amount of hours they were working in the 1890s. You know, Roughly well, like, like a that. month per year. Yeah, a month per year. Since the late like 60s. And one of the reasons behind that, she argues, is that we've become a world not of producers but of consumers, or at least a country of, of consumers, mm -hmm. and that we consume, 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 consume. And uh, it always strikes me of how people go to the Gap, for example, and uh, you could drop $100 for a, for a small shirt. I mean, these, these are very expensive clothes in a, in a lot of ways. And in the early part of the 20th century, there was the same kind of shift, this kind of consumerist activity, where Labor Day itself became highly commodified. Um, it shifted to uh, the idea not of a politics, not of a, a movement for social justice and change, but as these people were rightly indicating, it shifted to a leisure time uh, activity. And so here you see the ways in which you know, the 20th century has increasingly commodified these various um, activities, including something as once so political as you know, Labor Day. And so I was just struck you know, by this, this way in which the tide, you know, is turning in some ways how consumerism has played itself out for a lot of Americans. We have lots of things, but we're working harder for them, and we're getting less, and we've become depoliticized. You know, and how can we get back on track? Um, how do we get back to that moment, you know, of bread and roses mm -hmm. in some ways? And I think you know what uh, we're talking about is these alliances between the middle class and the working classes. Um, the myth that there is no such thing as class struggle or class war is just that, it's a myth. And it's not something that just came out of nowhere. Um, it's perpetuated on purpose to divide people. And I think today we're seeing that we have to reach across those classes uh, once again. Mm -hmm. And we need to really rethink our consumption patterns uh, and what that's all about when we go to the mall mm -hmm. and, and buy something from Gap. And I think that this is the beginning of a, of a, of a great moment of change and transformation of how middle-class consumers can do something to change uh, the ways in which uh, these uh, activities go on, the ways in which workers are exploited mm -hmm. in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Hong Kong, and in New York City mm -hmm. and, and California. Right. There's, there's, there's Michael there's, Kavanaugh? Yeah, there's, uh, I mean, there's, there's plenty of exploitation to go around, uh, of course. Um, I, and I do think, and I, I sort of argue in this uh, column that I wrote in this month's uh, Dissident, that there are places, and I suggest like large retailers are good places where you know the, you know that's where the uh, you know production meets the consumer, and uh, and these are very you know increasingly concentrated large, you know corporations, high profile gaps and and the WalMarts and the Banana Republics and you know whatever they are out there, they are you know offering for sale you know goods uh, that people haven't really considered. Uh, how it is they come to market, and just the same thing, you know. I was thinking about when I got involved with the labor movement it was really around, initially around the farm workers uh, boycott and around, the, you know, stuff with Cesar Chavez back in, you mm -hmm. know, the late '60s and early '70s, because it was the, for the first time sort of making the connection between 
those things that were brought to market and, and what were the conditions like that got them to that market. And that really touched a lot of people, a lot of so-called middle-class reformers and and others in the society got active around that campaign because they, you know, they really drove home the point about exploitation of workers to provide your table grapes or your mm -hmm. lettuce or whatever it might be. I think the very same thing is true uh, with uh, many, many products, and I think that's one pressure point that I think we in labor and as activists and social activists, we might be able to... Uh, to try to make the connections that you were referring to earlier. And it's exactly what went on, you know, in the early 20th camera. century. Yeah. It's, it's the way in which uh, there was an absolute connection between production and consumption. Mm -hmm. And women were really at the, at the edge, the real vanguard of making that understanding, whether they're middle class women or working class women, because they were the ones that were often involved with and in charge of the family budgets, in mm -hmm. charge of converting a very small wage into a very large family budget. Mm -hmm. So in that conversion process, they saw those connections mm -hmm. uh, in ways that were historically very interesting for the labor movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you look at the labor movement before the 1920s, you see unions very much rooted in the community. And you see these kinds of connections and these kinds of links to the environment, to um, consumption habits, to food, the price of food, the cost of housing, and the paycheck all being made. Mm -hmm. That really stops. Once the bureaucracy of unions uh, takes hold, you find increasingly male leadership in the 1920s, and you find an increasing uh, antipathy uh, towards um, oh, unskilled laborers, but also towards community activism and what they call sort of non-bread and butter issues, mm -hmm. uh, the larger, broader social kinds of issues. Uh, that once made the labor movement in the late 19th, early 20th century great, uh, those issues were really purged from the agenda you know, of, of, of the labor movement. Mm -hmm. And so there was a movement to a more highly bureaucratized, a much more distant kind of uh, labor organization, mm -hmm. which I think today is, is changing. Yeah, I think it, it absolutely just, is. just uh, interject to remind mm -hmm. our listeners, you're listening to Big Talk, we're talking about labor, and uh, uh, it is a call-in show, the number is 78049. Oh, nine. And Michael Kavanaugh was just jumping in. Yeah, the point I wanted to make is I think there are some very uh, healthy changes in a lot of, uh, you know, interesting uh, union activity that we see uh, uh, currently. In uh, fact... Uh, well, if I can just interject yeah. with the question, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, I know that there's been a lot in the news. Your union joined with another right. union, so there's Unite coming out of two uh, historic unions. And then uh, very recent... Uh, big news for at least labor people, which is that the biggest unions in the country just about are the education mm -hmm. unions, steel workers, auto workers, and the auto workers right. are, have these big plans to merge in coming mm -hmm. years. So, mm -hmm. uh, in all of this, is there a reinvigoration of the labor movement? Well, I, I think it's a reflection of some reinvigoration. I mean, I think that you know the fact that mergers are happening, mergers are happening because you, maybe there's some consolidation and better. Hopefully, you can better utilize resources. Right. Uh, and I think that's positive. Uh, in our own case, uh, the mergers uh, was really predicated on there being a, a substantial investment in our organizing program. That's where our f the future is, is in organizing and reconnecting with kind of community organizing, as Artis was suggesting. You know, I think that those are the kinds of plans that are being talked about with other organizations as well. There's a very active contest right now for the presidency of the AFL-CIO right. that is going to be decided at a convention later this fall. And both candidates, uh, Tom Donahue, who is the current uh, president, and John Sweeney, who is his challenger, and, and their respective slates, they're both talking about uh, really you know, reinvigorating the organizing program and the organizing focus of what labor is all about. Uh, that's good, that's healthy, it's overdue, but it's there. Uh, in, in our case, we just went through our own union prior to the merger, Act Two, uh, went through a very exciting and ultimately successful organizing campaign on a community organizing basis in a community in Martinsville, Virginia. And we organized you know, 2,300 mm -hmm. workers at the Taltex Company, which mm -hmm. is a, you know, a, a very large uh, you know, victory by anybody's uh, measurement. Wow. Uh, this is Taltex that makes uh, cotton sweatshirts. Everybody probably has. You go home, you've got Taltex sweatshirts, I'll bet you. Uh, they have been made in a you know, non-union environment in a very uh, sort of paternalistic mm -hmm. company town uh, down in southern Virginia. And uh, a very exciting uh, union organizing drive was ultimately successful. Uh, and I would just take this opportunity to tell viewers that, there, that this is profiled. One of the this is one of the few cases that's profiled 
on this show called We Do the Work that's being broadcast uh, nationally. Uh, it'll be broadcast on Channel 10 in Maine uh, sometime here in the next, uh, we're not quite certain the exact date, but it's to be broadcast around Labor Day or soon thereafter, and we're encouraging people to check with Channel 10 to find out when. But it's uh, this, uh, the, the We Do the Work series, which is syndicated nationally, is now profiling the struggles of workers. Taltex, in our case, also a group of nurses in Alabama who are trying to organize the Sprint telephone workers, the part-time temporary no-benefit workers out, the telemarketers in California, uh, Hispanic women who tried to form a union, and you know the company responded by simply closing up shop and leaving. Uh, and there are a number of, I think, exciting grassroots organizing efforts that workers are undertaking uh, that are really going to be uh, the the future of our labor movement. And Mike, I want to I want to be devil's advocate here. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been talking about some strategies, and maybe maybe in some ways you've you've begun to answer this question. But the reality is, historical parallels aside, and they they are useful. But we have entered a very different kind of economy. We call it the globalization of the mm -hmm. of, of the economy, and we're now looking at um, what is it now? I hear something like seven hundred million unemployed people in the world and jobs flowing flowing across borders in the way that we haven't seen in our past how does labor legitimately say that they can la american labor i'm talking that they can protect american jobs when that kind of phenomenon is really happening how can you how can you do it well i don't think you can do it in isolation clearly to the extent that the borders are down it's just like the borders are down between maine and new hampshire and between you know, any state in the north and states in the south. Now they're down between any place in the world. And clearly the only answer ultimately is that, uh, you know, organization of workers and struggle of workers to, to raise standards uh, has to happen on a global basis. And so we have to be international in our perspective. Uh, you know, you try to be. You do what you can at the local level. I know that our organization has been quite active, as I said, in terms of this thing with the Central American workers. Uh, but. I do believe that that's a, a perspective that increasingly labor is, I mean, you know, we're not, you know, we weren't, you know, we were born at night but not last night. And we understand that this is a world global economy and that we've got to be uh, a world global movement just like capital is, is global. And um, it's, it's a challenge. On, on the way in. I mean, in some ways it's not so new, though, and not mm. so different than what was in the 19th century. You know, in the 19th that's century right. you saw New England. Uh, in mm -hmm. a way that was uh, very much dominated by industrialization, and they moved then south, and now they're moving elsewhere. So sometimes moving regionally in this country had the similar effect as it's having now in terms of globally moving. It's much more systematized now. It's much more heavily capitalized now. But in some ways, it's the same kind of procedure and process. And I think I agree you know, with Michael, what, what, what he's saying, that that's the ultimate goal of organizing uh, you know, around the world in some ways. But I think there's another issue here that, that the, the union movement really needs to address, and that is this whole, uh, if you will, image problem. Mm -hmm. um, there's a way in which, mm -hmm. rightly or wrongly, I think the images of a union uh, in the past 20 and 25 years has been a very negative image. Mm -hmm. And I know that's been purposely and systemat systematically um, created uh, by a variety of people. But if you look at various states, you'll see these right to, to work laws have been popular laws and have been implemented in what? How many? 11 like, or no, 19, 19, 19 states. states. Tell, tell you know, us, yeah. artists, what, our listeners, uh, what uh, is well, a right to work law? Right to work laws basically were passed. Um, it has nothing to do with yeah. the right to work. No. It has nothing say. to do with right <laughs> to work. <laughs> there, no. there are no rights. No. Um, but they basically were, were, were union busting tactics, mm. and it was a way of trying to make a state like the state of Arkansas. Um, free of uh, unions right. with an idea that you could open up a, a non-union shop or an open shop uh, in, in their state. And this is, again, something that many people think, um, uh, you know, think is somehow illegal because of the Wagner Act that we were talking <laughs> about earlier or that somehow is not, not happening. So these right-to-work um, laws that have been passed uh, are a part, I think, in a response or a reflection of the image that American labor movement has presented uh, to people who are non-union people mm -hmm. uh, or people in other kinds of occupations mm -hmm. and whatever. Mm -hmm. and I think that's really something that the labor movement needs to, to address much more um, aggressively, much more vehemently than, I, than I'm seeing it happen. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree. I, I think that is true. I mean, you have to, uh, 
we have to try to reflect, who, you know, who who are American workers right. and. And American workers are, well, I mean, we're all sorts of people. We're men, we're women, we're old, we're young, we're black, we're white, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, our labor movement is very often, you know, you know, white males. And, you know, I mean, I'm a white male, but, but there's more out there than me. Uh, there are, you know, lots of uh, other people who are active in their unions and are really, I mean, sort of the, the people who are most likely to be uh, organizing and fighting at the grassroots now to be building unions are... You know, women and their black women or, you know, Hispanic women or, I mean, that's where the future is within the labor movement. I, I agree with you that we need to be projecting that we are uh, broader in terms of who we represent than what the leadership might look like. Yeah. Um, if I could uh, jump in with a question, Artis. Uh, remind our listeners, there's still a few more minutes left to call in at 780-4909. Um, and in looking at the question of historical parallels, I mean, we're, we're kind of talking about the labor movement is trying to, in a sense, pick itself up by the bootstraps at this point and become more resourceful and more active in organizing people. Um, but, you know, moving away from the labor movement to, in a sense, the other side, um, I think that there are a lot of things about what we're seeing in the 1980s and 1990s that harken back to those dark days that people usually say that, well, unions were needed a hundred years ago when there was exploitation and terrible things went on, but you start to look at what's going on, uh, the scapegoating of immigrants, all right, which was very big in the early 20th century and very big in recent years, uh, affirmative action essentially being an extension of that, which also was an attack on women. Um, uh, the ability of employers to act, engage in very hostile acts towards workers without the government stepping in and protecting workers' mm -hmm. rights, you know, that was a characteristic of that time. And that's come back when, where the, you know, a national labor law under the Wagner Act passed in the 1930s has basically been just about repealed in practice as a matter of law. Um, and so, you know, people can look back to the 1920s as a very dark time for American labor. Um, and it's looking a lot like that now. But um, one thing that I think people who know America's labor history know is that uh, however bad things look today, we can't necessarily say that they're going to be bad tomorrow. What is your sense of perspective on that? Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, I think it's Kevin. important to remember that the labor union, the labor movement is not a monolith. Um, it's not a single thing. It, 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 it's very multiple, and there are lots of parts to it, lots of pieces to it. And its history doesn't march triumphantly, you know, across time and through time from from the bad old days to now the good old days uh, in kind of incremental increases and improvements. I think as, as Michael was saying earlier, uh, we've seen a real decline, uh, mm -hmm. not only in the number of uh, workers who are unionized, but in the incredible standard of living mm -hmm. in America has, has definitely decreased. And I think one of the sad things is that the, uh, the splits that we were talking about and making allusion to, mm -hmm. particularly the one between so-called, uh, you know, the feminist movement, let's say, and mm. the union movement mm. that, that seems and is perceived to be split um, and somehow antagonistic to each other. Uh, if we look at the wages of women uh, in 1990, uh, we do see that women have moved from 57 cents for every dollar to almost 61 cents uh, to every dollar. But that's not because women have gained money. Mm. It's because white men have lost incomes. Right. Right. And so we have a lot together. You know, we have a mm -hmm. lot to share and we're in the same boat together. Um, and so the hostility that has sometimes played between a white male workforce seeing immigrants and women taking their jobs is really a tragic, um, seems to me, historically very tragic part of the, the recent union years. Mm -hmm. And it really needs to be, be overcome and realize that we're all in this, the same boat. You know, uh, the old union uh, songs of solidarity and, and mm -hmm. unite um, and the idea that uh, you know we're all this, what, what's the what's the classic thing united we stand you know divided we fall I mean it's it's really very clear and the chickens are coming home to roost uh, for the labor movement mm -hmm. and also like the early 20th century um, you know people have been focusing Gingrich and the Republicans have been trying to focus the blame uh, for these decline in, in living standards on on uh, uh, African Americans and women getting you know some kind of supposedly special assistance. Uh, through uh, quotas and so forth right. associated with affirmative action. But um, the statistics are very clear. There's one group that's been getting rich in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. 10, 15 years, and it's the rich. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The rich have been getting, they doubled their incomes in the 1980s and 90s. 
um, while everybody else uh, stagnated or declined. And that's a lot like the early 20th century. And what the labor movement was able to do very successfully in the 30s and 40s, uh, and at other times as well, is to focus the attention there. That That's that's where the issue yeah. lies. I, I think that's true. We can't, you know, be, we can't be perceived as, nor can we in fact be uh, representing just the uh, you know, whatever percentage of the workforce that we currently represent in collective bargaining agreements. I mean, that's a one-way ticket to extinction. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a debate within the labor movement about that. Certainly there are those union members who work hard, who pay their dues, who feel like the union ought to be putting its efforts into protecting them, somehow to, to defending them. And that's, and that's a very legitimate, and there's nothing wrong with it. That's, that's an absolutely correct feeling mm -hmm. for them to have because, uh, you know, the labor unions are... You know, historically defensive. I mean, we're trying to defend living standards. Uh, uh, however, we have got to be making the connections between uh, those of us who are currently represented in, in a collective bargaining agreement and those people who would like to be but who don't have a job any longer or you know, can't get employed or can't get full-time work or whatever. I mean, we represent workers whether they are currently dues-paying union members or they're working in a non-union environment or they're working in some profession or, or trade that's not organized at all, somebody's got to be out there fighting for and trying to organize workers. And as for all of our faults and all of our shortcomings, uh, you know, there ain't anybody else out there representing right. workers. And uh, as you suggested, Michael, a, a little bit earlier, that you're also focusing attention on workers workers in the in the third world oh, as well uh, and i just like to get back so we're about to run out of time but i'd like to get back to your beginning to dis describe for us the campaign that unite is about to launch sure um really focusing our attention on just these issues that's a, that's a good point and we are trying to you know as a as a new union we're trying to make it clear that our union is, is standing up for rights of workers whether they be in the united states or offshore because we're all bound together and yeah, currently, the gap is a focus of that, and uh, for all of you who are interested, uh, we're going to be in the next uh, couple of weeks probably visiting some of our local gap stores uh, with uh, distributing just some information to consumers about how it's now back to school time. It's time for people to be buying their back to school clothes. Yet, here's a photo of uh, girls, young girls, getting off a school bus, which is dropping them off in front of a factory in El Salvador where they can go into the factory Child for 14 labor. hours and produce back to school clothing that they have no hope of ever being able to afford to purchase, never mind being able to go to a school where they could wear it. And that essentially the flyer goes on to, to sort of grade the gap. How does the gap, what sort of a grade does the gap get on human rights, fairness, and, you know, decency? And uh, currently the gap is flunking, and we want to make sure that this report card gets out to consumers, and hopefully that people start to understand the connections between uh, you know, us here in Portland, Maine in 1995 and workers around the world and we're all bound together and we'd better get our, our act together. Well, so we thank you for the alert. Sure, and, please uh, join us at the Gap. You bet. Okay. So, uh, another we've, we've hour. run out of time. <laughs> big talk. Uh, it always seems like it goes fast. We have plenty um, more that I wish we could, we could visit, but so we won't be able to tonight. We have lots of big thanks to give uh, to Big Talk folks. Um, first, a big thanks to our guests, Artis Cameron. Thanks for coming in again. And uh, Mike Cavanaugh, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Um, Wendy, we have uh, our wonderful engineer tonight, Carrie Donahue. Um, our excellent feature done tonight by Teresa Parisi, and uh, we have many other big talk uh, folks. Uh, well, we certainly have Claire Holman, who's somewhere out there. Claire, in absentia, and uh, <laughs> and perhaps out of state for the moment. And perhaps Jessica Lockhart is also somewhere out there, our fearless engineer and uh, often and, reporter. And uh, Susan Aquilo. And Susan. And Laura Thanks. Hamill. And. Uh, Goodness, we, we are everybody? growing. <laughs> We're a growing plan. And next week we'll be talking about the impact of uh, changes in health insurance, the ones that throw people out of the hospital, impacting the profession of psychotherapy. So please join us next week for another session of Big Talk. Thanks. Good night. Thank good you. Night. And uh, this, is, uh, this is about good night for those of you who've been joining us uh, via the video. Uh, this has been, I think, <laughs> a successful uh, edition of Kavanaugh's Corner, the Labor Talk Show. Joining forces with uh, Mike Hillard, Wendy Hazard, and Artis Cameron here at uh, WMPG in Portland. And uh, this is the uh, Kavanaugh's Corner slash Big Talk television radio a thon. So well, thank you for joining and good night, all. 
Ooh. Well, talk about sweatshop. <laughs> yeah. Can we get that window? Let's yes, please do. Pack it.